We have a special guest with us this morning, so we're going to break into our schedule for a few minutes because this is an opportunity we did not want to miss. I'd like to introduce again to you Lena Gardner from Black Lives of UU and one of our beloved elders, Dr. Sanyika, to tell us a little bit about his story. I don't have too much to say this morning. I just want to extend deep gratitude to my elder. We call him Baba, which is a name of reference and honoring. Um, it was so amazing to meet Baba for the first time at the Blue Convening in March. And since then, we've had many rich discussions. And we brought him to General Assembly uh, to do the workshops to share his story with us about what happened in the late 60s about lessons learned and how to build intergenerationally and how we grow from here. So without further ado, uh, Baba. Good morning, Unitarian Universalist Association General Assembly. Come on, you can do better than that. It's a good day yeah. that history had made, has made, and let all the earth be silent and give praises to that which is holy and sacred. I cannot, <clears throat> excuse me, express to you my profound gratitude, thanks, and appreciation for your giving me this opportunity. I say that because the last time I addressed your General Assembly was almost 50 years ago. 50 years ago. That infamous General Assembly of 1969 in Boston, which had been preceded by the 1968 General Assembly in Cleveland, where the Black Affairs Council was awarded $250,000 for four years, or so it thought proceeded by the Seattle General Assembly, which I did not attend. So I have a lot of mixed emotions, but you're in my home city. <laughs> you, <laughs> and I want to thank you for bringing me home. And when I knew you were in New Orleans, the spirit told me you got to come home. Now, I was that guy when you all did the parade in that aisle over there saying, shake your booty. <laughs> shake what your mama gave you. And I could not resist, at the very end, joining that second line to dance with my New Orleans family among my Unitarian Universalist friends. Lord, have mercy. So thank you for bringing me home. But let me also say, I come today because my heart is heavy. And it is heavy because the person who introduced me to UUism in 1962, Dr. Albert D. Orlando, has never been given his proper due. That is my humble opinion that history needs to correct, that this is where I learned what Unitarian Universalism was. His home and his church were bombed, and his membership in the Urban League was taken from him because he was accused of being a communist. How ridiculous. That's an injustice that we hope will be corrected one day. So I want to thank you for that reason, and I just feel good being among you, although there are all kinds of things running through my mind about how you will respond to what it is I want to share. I don't have time to do an adequate job, but pray with me as we try to do a little bit. But you know, I have been observing the transformation of, of the, the, the cultural practices within this denomination for a while. While we have been gone almost 50 years, we have not been completely remote. 1,500 of us left the denomination because of the internal contradictions of what we called then structural racism and institutional racism, which we appropriately term today as white supremacy. But we left for those reasons, but we have not been immune. And I heard some singing in here like I've never heard before. <laughs> I heard 
people using the word God. I said, wait a minute, am I, am I in the right place? I, I, I wanted to shout hallelujah. Glory. Glory to her name and his. But I heard something in particular, <clears throat> excuse me, which really confirmed why I am here today. I heard something said last night, there is a new name in Zion. A new name in Zion, it is pronounced B-L-U-U, blue. <laughs> and as those of us in the movement of the 60s say, from bucking back to blue. Buck was the Black Unitarian Universalist Caucus. Back was its Black Affairs Council. That's those of us who left 50 years ago. And today, there has been a revival of that movement for which we give thanks to the Holy and all of you who are responsible for it. So for us, it's from bucking back to blue. And we are proud to say that the torch has been passed to a new generation born out of civil rights, born out of the contradictions of this country, but smart enough to see that the justice movement does not end. And I am so extremely proud of you today because you have fulfilled that historical mission that Franz Fanon talked about in The Wretched of the Earth when she said every generation in its relative obscurity must find its own mission, confirm it or deny it. That mission has been confirmed. You did a good thing, but it ain't over yet. But I am just feeling so good, like somebody said last night, you really have come home, haven't you? This used to be my home, New Orleans, but Katrina swept me away. And Unitarian Universalism used to be my spiritual home. White supremacy swept me away. So some people said, you've really come home twice, huh? Well, part of my life will always be touched by the experience that I had with you. And while I am not officially a part of you, you can never take me away from you. So I give myself back to the struggle, not the structure, but to the struggle and the justice that needs to be done. The second thing that I want to share is that history has a way of choosing us. We don't choose history. We are used by history to reconcile humanity unto itself. Unitarian Universalism at its finest and at its best is an instrument to transform humanity so that it can evolve to its highest level of consciousness and potential. <laughs> at its best. And it must constantly be vigilant to denounce all forms of human oppression, exploitation, degradation, domination, and control in any form that it comes. UUism at its best is a transformative agent for justice and liberation and peace in the world. At its best. But it can't do that if it marginalizes humanity. If it leaves anybody out at the table, you cannot fulfill that mission. You cannot fulfill that mission by being partial to some and not fair with all. Justice and equity must define who you are and what you do with who you claim to be. Because it's not just saying what you believe that matters. It's what you do with it. That's why I love Brother Jesus so much and people who follow Jesus. I ain't talking about the institutional Christian church here, but I'm talking about the spirit of the Lord is upon me and he has called me to liberate the oppressed. As a matter of fact, if he were here today, he'd be hanging out with y'all, I think. <laughs> the second point <clears throat> is that white supremacy still exists 50 years later. Don't think I haven't been reading all those emails. I know something is percolating in the spirit that's challenging power and principality, and Blue is trying to speak truth to power. <laughs> truth to power. 
And you need to be in full and absolute support of that social movement as you are to it with others. But it begins with trust. It begins with you believing that the virus of racism and white supremacy is still around us. And it metastasizes. It sneaks up on you when you ain't looking. Excuse my English. I'm a professor. I'm not supposed to speak like that. But I'm also a cultural vernacular, so I can talk the way I choose in my hometown. <laughs> So we must always be vigilant and look, first of all, within ourselves, because the greatest contradiction we have is the contradiction of the self. You say one thing, you do something else. You claim one thing, you unclaim it when it is comfortable. You know, eliminating white supremacy is an uncomfortable business, because white privilege has existed for so long that cognitive dissonance is a part of our culture, we must dig deep into our human spirits and say, absolutely, we are the new humanity becoming, so we can't tolerate the old world as it exists. And guess what? 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue is not in control of the world. There's a, there's a higher power, there's a higher power that I report to, and it ain't of this earth. The peace that I have doesn't come from this place. It's beyond, and I invite you to join that journey with me. The third thing that I wanted to share is that self-determination and empowerment of people has been proven to be the antibody against the exploitation. Self-determination is a natural right that people have. So when we proclaimed it 50 years ago and it made some people uncomfortable, so be it. The discomfort was against the traditional injustice of the UUA and its leadership at 25 Beacon Street, which was the myth castle, as we called it. That was the injustice, but we got caught in the confusion about who runs this institution. Should it be you, the UUA General Assembly, or that board of directors, which was insensitive to the need for justice and transformation at that time? And so self-determination all across all religious denominations, churches, universities, institutions, or have affirmed self-determination, people's right to decide their own destiny. And if you want a relationship with me, you must respect my right to control my own destiny and to determine it. You cannot, on the one hand, claim yourself to be a justice warrior in which the eighth principle ought to be part of who you are. Oh, you didn't think I knew that, huh? and at the same time deny the right of self-determination to people, not just on inside the UUA, but throughout the whole of this world and this society. That is what people are struggling for, self-determination and empowerment to be the finest human beings that they have been made to be. The fourth thing that I want to share is that UUism is still under construction. Y'all know about con under construction? You have not achieved the perfect state. And there is no exceptionalism. You see, there, there's different kinds of liberals. There's the, the pro-libs, as we call them, the mod-libs, and the con-libs. <laughs> the pro-libs are progressive. They are affirm the right of self-determination and empowerment for people and justice unconditionally all the time. The mod-libs say, but. <laughs> Conservative libs say, oh, uh, we, can't, we can't go there. We, we can't have that in, in our church. So we learned that there was, there was that going on, but UUism is therefore still under construction because the historical forces are moving forward and you're not gonna be on the tail end but trying to be on the front end. You wanted to claim Dr. King, but you didn't understand the radical nature of his politics. <laughs> and so in 1967, when we took over that conference and formed the Black Caucus, it was our right to do so. But the reason we did so is because we were sick and tired of being sick and tired of being sick and tired of those con liberals tricking us, saying one thing and doing something else. That's why we said no negotiation. No negotiation. Take it or leave it, but no negotiation. Let me say this, and I've got one more point, and then I'll be sitting down. And that is that being under construction means you are constantly aware. It means that you are constantly responsive to the demands around you, that you do not think you have reached that perfect state where there's something called unitary universalist exceptionalism, because there is no UU exceptionalism. You are still under construction, and there's nothing wrong with still being constructed. As we say in my tradition, the most high is not finished with you yet. You still have a long ways to go, so don't be infatuated with yourself, please.
My fifth and final point is that when we were within this denomination, we initiated a dialogue on something called black humanism. It has gone all over the place since then. And I apologize for not finishing that story. But our hearts were so heavy and our minds were so, so dis distant that we chose to practice black humanism rather than bother Unitarian Universities about trying to understand it. When we left in 1969, that was not a walkout. It was an exodus. It was an exodus because we no longer felt we had a home. We no longer felt the love and care. We no longer felt that black humanism was on the agenda to be discussed. You see, because we've always said human agency is at the center of transformation, but you can't do it without divine reconciliation. We say we can be theists and non-theists. I know some of you want to argue that point, but we can talk about that. I don't mind talking about it because we were no longer talking about kindergarten theology with some spookistic white guy sitting up in no sky. That's not what we were talking about. We were criticizing the church across the board, not just UUism, but we invite that conversation in the modern era so that we can all modernize our understanding that there can be no humanism without discussing black humanism. It can't be. Why? Because we are a part of the human family who has contributed to the discourse on what it means to be human. So we invite that conversation with everybody who claims to have some form of humanism in their background. But you must remember, you have a history of Christian humanism in your background, too. So don't throw the baby out with the bathwater and say that there is nothing but humanity, because once you do that, you reinforce white supremacy without even knowing you're doing it. So the conversation about black humanism is really a conversation about salvation. <laughs> but it's about the salvation of all humanity. Because we are a part, just like black lives matter, black humanism matters. But so does all humanity. So does all other humanism that seeks justice and transformation and peace. There is a book that I now am able to write and to narrate this story because of what you have allowed me to do with you, you here today. I've tried it in the past, but I didn't have writer's frozen pen. I had spiritual frozen pen. My soul was not anchored in the Lord. It was disturbed. It was uneven. Today, I feel my soul is free to tell you this story from the depths of my heart and my mind. So I will promise you, I will do that book. I promise you, I will do that book. You are a remarkable man. Let me finish one sentence. And I say it to all of you who were my friends, all my LRY colleagues, Bill Sinkford was a young man then, he's not as young as he used to be, Robbie Isaac, Denny Davis, Larry Ladd, all of y'all who I've seen and not seen, thank you for your love and friendship over the years. I appreciate being, seeing you again. It's like a marvelous homecoming experience that I have had. And I simply say to all of you this, lift every voice and sing. Till earth and heaven ring, ring, ring with the harmonies of liberty. Facing the rising sun of a new day begun. Let us march on. Let us march on, Unitarian Universalists. Lead us with the rest of all humanity into that beloved community that we all desire. Let us march on. Let us march on till victory is won. Hallelujah. Ashe.